Legend of Total War here, and today we've got another tier list using Tier Maker, this time covering the Wood Elves. Now this one will be probably a little bit more difficult for me to cover than other races because there's a lot of other factors that we've got to take into consideration for this particular uh, list because the Wood Elves are actually kind of a complicated race. They play very differently from other races and they have a lot of strengths. They're arguably one of the, the strongest races on the battlefield, but they're also one of the weakest races in terms of their campaign abilities and things that they can do in the campaign because they can only really make money from a select few settlements. They still suffer from 15% uh, supply line penalties, which absolutely hurts them more than a lot of other races. And they can barely defend a lot of their settlements, like their outposts. Even though these outposts aren't worth a lot, yeah, they have a hard time holding on to them. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration. In addition to that, a lot of their units require two buildings to recruit, which makes them inconvenient. So in this tier list here, this is less about how strong the unit is and more about how convenient it is and how much it affects you on the campaign map, because that's the most important thing. Why are you fighting battles in Total War Warhammer 2 on campaign? You're fighting it to advance on the campaign map. If a particular unit is slowing you down on the campaign map, then something is wrong there, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Even if that unit has, like, super strong stats, you've got to take into consideration all the other factors. So I just want to make that clear. So, as usual, we're going to be rating this based on Legendary Difficulty Campaign. Very hard battle. Um, no mods, no multiplayer based on Ultra Unit Scale. If you're not playing on those settings, you'll probably have a varying result with these units now in terms of organizing it because there's so many different categories here and like a, a handful of units in each category what i'm going to do is just separate into just two categories wood elf units and then forest spirits keep it real simple this time okay so let's start with the uh the wood elves so starting with their most basic unit let's start with archers this time so we're talking about glade guard and there's three different variants. We've got the Glade Guard, the Hagbane Tip, and the Starfire Shaft. Let me just confirm that. Is that correct? Yep, Starfire Shafts. Okay, so looking at that, um, the regular Glade Guard can be recruited from a basic building, which means it's super convenient. You don't even need a military building to get it, so you can get them straight away. You'll eventually be able to globally recruit them in one turn quicker than any other unit, so replacing them is, is really quick. Uh, they're also readily available in outposts, so this is a very easy to recruit unit. Uh, in terms of how they perform, they're amazing because they've got exceptionally good range. The only unit, only like tier zero unit in the game that outranges them are high elf archers, and you should absolutely not be fighting high elves in the early game. Generally speaking, the high elves are going to be the most friendly race in the game to you, so you really shouldn't be fighting high elves unless you're going for a world conquest um so in terms of range they basically outrange ev everyone and they're at a good price point they've got a good amount of damage and they can fire while moving only while moving forward i suppose uh, allowing them to be quite good at actually running enemy units down once the battle is over because that's one thing about regular sort of archer spams once the battle's over you just if you don't build cavalry which i usually don't um you just have to let you know, a third of whatever how much is left of their army just run away. Now these guys here, they don't have to do that. They can keep pursuing them and run them down without the need of cavalry. And we'll get onto that later um, about the cavalry problem with uh, with Wood Elves because of the uh, the um, the versatility of their archers. Oftentimes makes their cavalry completely useless. All right, so Glade Guard, really good unit. Where I'm going to put that? I'm going to put the Glade Guard at not Doomstack. I'm going to put it at eight here. Really, one of the best archer units in the game. Good cost, good performance, just really, really convenient. That's exactly what you want out of you, you know, just not that many downsides. It just, it gets outclassed in the late campaign, but in the early game, it's the perfect unit for you. Okay, and then we've got these ones here. So this actually requires a military building. Now, at tier one with the Wood Elves, you've got three construction slots. Now, it's really important to keep in mind campaign effects with Wood Elves. I'm going to drive this home really heavily in this one because it's so important, more important than a lot of the other races. You need to build the economic buildings as the Wood Elves. You have to build them because you need that growth in order to get other things going because it takes forever to get all the kindreds needed to finish everything. Like, we're not even finishing this particular campaign here, although it's only like turn 60. Um, you don't need growth to get this pushed up, but what you need is money. This is very expensive buildings. So in terms of priority, you'd want to get these all of these buildings done right away, especially the tier one stuff, because this provides tons of extra cash. If you're building a tier one military building 
and only two of these, you're missing out on a lot of money until you get to tier two, right? And these, this building often takes quite a while to build because getting the first kindred point just takes like, like barely any time, but getting to two and three and then to five, because each kindred point takes longer than the previous one. So getting to this one here takes fucking forever, right? So you need to get all of these ones early to start building up your economic base because you, once you get into late campaign, their finances become a little bit more tricky. Anyway, so a little bit inconvenient to recruit uh, that, build that building at tier one, right? Now, another thing is that the Glade Guard Starfire Shafts also require the Azrae Forge, so you need to be at tier two to get them, and you need a second building in order to get it. So in terms of these units here, even though they're technically better, because they are vastly less convenient... I'm going to put this one at C tier and this one here at actual trash, even though they are actually better units because it comes down to convenience. Look, this one here, the only advantage it has over this one is simply magic damage. Now, magic damage does not bypass armor. The only thing it bypasses is physical resistance. Now, the thing is, in the early stages of the campaign, you are actually more likely to encounter units with magic resistance than physical resistance. There's actually more units in the game that have magic resistance than, than physical resistance, right? So if you're building this unit in the early game and you're fighting dwarfs, you're actually making your army weaker by recruiting this one over getting regular ones. So you're actually better going with physical damage. Now, there's ways to actually improve this, but that happens later on in the campaign because there's a hero trait that you can get with branch rates which mitigate magic um, ma magic resistance for the enemy. Now, thing to keep in mind, if you're going to do that, you get branch rates at tier 3. And by the time you get to tier 3, there's other units that you can get. So all of this is just happening at the wrong time. Now, the, the Starfire Shafts, the main benefit of that one is that you trade off some overall damage. You lose a bit of bit of base damage and gain armor piercing but again same problem in the early stages of the campaign are you going up against tons of armored units no you're not really and even even the glade guards still have a decent amount of armor piercing right so if you are going up against armor these guys here they have more than enough ammunition to do their worth two or even three times over so it's okay if you don't aim for covering all of your bases if the enemy have one or two armored units the trick is to simply not target those armored units target everything else kill the army and what's the 20 percent of them that are left will just get the army losses and then just let them go and then kill them in the next battle when you've got your full army and they've only got 20% of their forces left. So yeah, you just don't really need it. It's really inconvenient, which is why I I put it as uh, trash there. It just comes in at the wrong time. This one here covers all your bases for the early game. Okay, so next up for the what else? We're going to cover the uh, the base the mid game archer unit, the uh, the deepwood scouts. So we've got the regular deepwood scouts and then the swift shiver shards. So these ones here also suffer from a similar problem. This is at tier two. Now at tier two, you've got yourself five construction slots instead of three. So by that point, you've built all of these three and then you've got two other construction slots. So by that point, it's totally fine to have the deep wood camp and also the Av Azrae Forge. Another reason why I usually don't build the Azrae Forge though is because of the kindred cost because I want all my kindreds going into economics, uh, not necessarily into a forge which has fairly redundant units so i usually don't prioritize that but anyway talking about the merits of these units right the deepwood scout um has slightly higher range than glade guard at 180 they can fire from all directions so they can they can run backwards and keep shooting um they have i uh, no, the same level of um models so yeah they're just basically a straight up upgrade of the glade guard uh same amount of ammo I think it's the same amount of missile strength. I think the big downside to them is that they are higher upkeep. So their actual damage potential of uh, on, on a Glade Guard is actually exactly the same. Their ammunition multiplied by missile strength is exactly the same, but you're paying more for it. Now, here's the thing. If you're doing that, that means that every shot of your ammunition is worth more, in terms of what the game thinks, than a Glade Guard unit. And that can send up in a trap. Having overly expensive archer units with low amounts of ammo can actually end up in a trap if you're shooting low tier units uh, because the game will expect more of you. You can actually end up causing the army loss penalty on yourself by using too much ammunition. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I feel like with Deepwood Scouts, if they're going to be 
better. They kind of... Having 10 extra range and being able to fire while moving and moving backward definitely helps them against cavalry units, for sure, without a doubt. But having, like, two extra ammunition or two extra missile strength would have helped them a lot more um, in, in overall potential damage. If, if these two here were shooting at a completely stationary unit, which, of course, very rarely happens, they would dish out the exact same amount of damage. So in terms of where I'm going to put them, though... I'm going to put the uh, the Depot Scatter A tier because having that extra range and that extra mobility and also Stalk, I forgot to mention that, is very good. Now, the Swift Shiver Shard, they're not bad. I'm going to put them at C tier. But the reason why I'm putting it C tier is because they trade off quite a significant amount of range. You lose 45 range. Yep. And you gain magic damage, which again, you don't need at this stage of the campaign. And you get extra missile strength because they shoot two projectiles instead of one. So they actually dish out more damage than this one here. But again, you're you're requiring to get the Azrae Forge. So that's at this stage here, it's kind of okay. But this one here is just way more convenient and gets it gets the job done you just it's sort of just redundant at that point uh, at that tier because you've still got better archer units on top of that so now let's talk about the Waywatcher. now with the wood elves you don't require growth to get the uh the settlement level up you just require money we've already established that you build the economic buildings first so that you've got the money to just always be building these up to get straight to tier five as soon as possible you want to unlock the better units so that you can have tier five units going up against the enemy's tier three stuff and that includes getting to tier four and getting to the way watchers perch now this one here the way watcher is arguably one of the best archer units in the game because it has the highest base range except for the sentinels of astaral they stalk and they fire while moving and they're armor piercing so this is just all around an amazing unit apart from in melee they're super super squishy um you got to keep them out of melee but luckily there's things you can do to boost their range even further same thing with all the other ones as well i suppose with the talent of colonel straight for lords not with heroes that they nerfed that uh, you used to be able to get the range of Wave Watchers up to 310. Now you're probably looking at like 230 at hitting their maximum. But yeah, really high missile strength. You can, by this point here, increase their ammunition a fair bit. These ones here can really dish out a ton of damage. One of the biggest problems though with them is that they actually kind of fire too quickly and sometimes they can overkill models. But the Way Watcher is the first unit in the in the Wood Off roster that I'm going to put under the Doomstack status here. The excellent unit that you can spam and will absolutely slaughter the enemy in most cases. In my opinion, it used to be a little bit better, but they still uh, hit the Doomstack status. All right, that's all of the Wood Elf Archer units. Now let's move on to sort of like their melee infantry. Okay, so talking about the most basic one, we've got the Eternal Guard. So similar problems arise with these guys here. At Tier 1, you've got the Eternal Guard, and the Eternal Guard with shields requires the Azrae Forge. Now, we've kind of already established that at Tier 1, you should be building these right so you shouldn't even think about building this building this one here until you've hit tier two right now the the eternal guard they dish out more damage i suppose than other melee infantry from other races right but they are also a little bit squishy so 7200 for a melee infantry unit in terms of health is actually quite low a lot of other races have like 10,000 health especially like vampire counts right but what you're trading uh, your health for, and I guess your entity numbers, like 100 entity numbers for a tier 1 infantry unit is really low. That's like dwarf level. But dwarves have you know, a lot of defense capabilities. What you've got is damage potential here. Armor piercing and anti-large. And with the uh, Eternal Guard here, uh, the Eternal Guard with shield, what you're trading for, for this inconvenience is just a shield. That's all it provides here. You get the silver shield and a bit of extra melee defense, which is good, which is good for sure. But it's not, you don't need it. And considering the resources needed to get them, they're really inconvenient. Even the uh, the regular Glade Guard here will outperform this one here. Like, you don't necessarily need this one to hold the line for it. Even having one of these units here in front of your other archers to hold the line, at least it'll get some shots off first, right? So it's actually done some damage. These guys here, they're... They dish out more damage than other units, but you still have to deal with the enemy uh, uh, melee cheats. So, I'm going to put this one at C tier and this one at trash, just because it's re it's probably one of the most inconvenient early game units to recruit, and I would highly avoid getting it. If it didn't require the Bar uh, the Azrae Forge, I actually put it at B tier, because its stats are pretty good. 
But that extra forge, I just don't build that until at least tier 3. It's just not worth it. So that's where I'll put them. Uh, next we've got the medium tier uh, Wood Elf units. We've got the War Dancers. So we've got the anti-infantry variant and then the anti-large variant. Now, looking over both of these, at least these two here don't require the Azray Forge. So they're actually quite convenient. And at tier 2, it's totally fine to build this building because the Glade Captain is a really good hero to get. So I would quite often have this at tier 2. Uh, they've also got 20% physical resistance, which kind of makes up for their lack of shields. It's, it's kind of. Um, but they are, once again, a very squishy unit. They're actually squishier than Eternal Guard. But what you're trading for holding capabilities... I mean, they, they've got better melee defense. Um... Some of them, at least. Uh, what you're trading for is uh, extra damage dealers. But the thing is, the Wood Elf Archer units are still better damage dealers because the AI uh, melee defense cheats, because they get 20% extra melee defense, right? That doesn't do anything against arrows. This is why archery is quite meta in very hard battles, because archery just bypasses all their melee cheats, whereas no matter what melee infantry unit you get in this game, you have to deal with the fact that every single AI unit is going to have that extra melee defense, so you're always fighting an uphill battle. This is why melee is usually not the meta. Usually. Some some races, it's they, they mitigate it a little bit. So, good melee infantry unit, as far as that goes, but I'm going to put them both at C tier, just because you've got better options at tier 2 and there's not that much of a difference between getting to tier 2 and tier 3 and getting to tier 3 has a very notable unit that I want to talk about now next up we've got the tier 3 units which are the blade singers and the wildwood rangers I'm going to talk about the wildwood rangers first so this one here um this main problem is I think the price 225 cost right um for a melee infantry unit that it, it, it does hit quite hard if you're putting it in forest. It also gets bonus versus large, so it is quite versatile. It's okay, but at tier 3, you've got better options, as always. Um, and they they do get hit quite hard because they don't have much armor. Usually other races, tier 3 infantry, kind of have a lot more armor than these guys. I mean, these guys here do have armor piercing, so that's good. I'm going to put them at B tier because they do hit hard, but I do think they sometimes underperform. Especially when considering the final unit in the melee infantry roster for the Wood Elves. We've got the Blade Singer. Now, this one here. The uh, the Blade Singer. It's quite expensive at 300. Honestly, I feel like the Blade Singer is actually a tier 4 unit, but they just they just didn't want to put a tier 4 barracks in there for whatever reason. It does also require the Azrae Armory. They've got the 20% physical resistance, they've got the magic damage, they've got anti-infantry and armor piercing, and this ability here which you can toggle, which it makes them better against unarmored uh, units. You just lose a little bit of armor piercing damage and gain more base damage quite significantly, so that's quite quite useful as long as you're not going go against armored units. Now, the thing is about Blade Singers is that if you just look at their base stats on their own, you'll think that, oh yeah, it's just a melee infantry unit. But the thing is with Blade Singers is that there's a lot you can do to boost them. Now, the things that you can do to boost the Blade Singers, you can always, you can do to boost the War Dancers as well, right? But the thing is, because the Blade Singers are significantly better, they, they get more of that bonuses, I suppose. So, the thing is with Blade Singers is that you can get their physical resistance up to something ridiculous. I can't remember what the exact number was, but you can make them almost impervious to uh, physical damage in terms of magic attack this is where if you really want the magic attack this is the unit to get because its level here coincides with the branch wraith at the branch wraith there's a trait that you can get uh with them that can mitigate enemy magic resistance in area so if you're dealing with dwarves this is the time to do so with this unit here not with not with the deepwood scout not with uh, the glade guard hagbane tip um, with this one here, because they'll anti-infantry, armor piercing, and magic damage, and physical resistance, uh, and you've got the uh, the trait that gets rid of their magic resistance, so you're doing maximum damage to them, they're doing minimum damage to you. This is like the anti-dwarf unit in the sort of mid-game, uh, actually kind of early game for, um, for, the, for the Wood Elves. Really, really strong infantry unit that is viable all the way through the campaign, as long as you keep boosting them. So I'm actually going to put the Bladesinger at Doomstack, but 
as a footnote here, you have to keep in mind, they are only considered a doom stack if you do everything that you need to boost them. Okay, if you don't put in the Lord skills, if you don't get the required heroes, it's important to get a Life Wizard as well. Um, if you don't do all of that stuff, this unit here is not going to perform anywhere near as well as it could. You need to stack on those other things. Otherwise, this unit would probably end up being B tier due to its price. So you've got to give it all of those boosts. It's really, really important. But if you do that, it's a Doom stack. All right, that's all of their melee infantry. Let's move on to cavalry now. So we'll start with uh, melee cavalry. All right, let's see. So we've got, I think they're called Glade Riders. Let me just check that. Yeah, Glade Riders with Spears. Uh, they don't have anti-large. They're just like a basic basic cavalry unit. Um, they kind of hit a bit harder than most other like super light cavalry. Sort of like, if you think about Yeoman Cavalry from Bretonia, this one here would probably beat it just because they they hit harder. Um, I think one of the big problems with the Wood Elves with the cavalry units is that it's just really inconvenient to recruit because they've got so many buildings and they've only got 10 slots right and at tier two like i said you've got five construction slots three of those slots have to be put into this if you're not doing that you're not playing optimally and this stuff is all about playing optimally right otherwise if you're playing on normal difficulty who cares you get it fine whatever it doesn't matter uh, you're not going up against anywhere near as difficult as an opponent you can make inefficient decisions it's fine and the thing is, at tier 2, in terms of military buildings, you've got the Archer building, and you've got the um, the one for the Glade Captain. This is really important. The Glade Captains are really important. Archers are really important. Where is the build slot needed for this? Well, then you got to get to tier 3. And at tier 3, well, then I kind of want to get this one, uh, these buildings going. Or maybe I want to get the Warhawk cages. Or maybe I want to build the guard platform. Every time I go up a tier, I usually find that there's other buildings that I just think are more important. And that some of the lowest priority buildings are... For, for one thing, this one here. That's fucking garbage, that building. I never build it. Totally useless. And uh, this one here is a low priority. And uh, this one here is actually one of the lowest priorities. Just because the cavalry are made kind of outdated. Because their role is... Because they're quite squishy, their role is to run broken units down. But the Wood Elf Archers are already able to do that because they can fire while moving, they're quick. They just don't really need cavalry support because the race just... It doesn't just doesn't complement their race. So that's part of the problem with them. And the thing is, if you're going to hire cavalry, you've got a hybrid choice. Horse Archers. So really, their cavalry <laughs> all end up in the trash. Yeah, what about Talson? Talson's rubbish, okay? Absolute rubbish. Okay, <laughs> look if you if you want to play as Talson, then maybe they can go up to B, t B tier, maybe. But anyway, let's talk about these two here, the the Wild Riders, right? So regular Wild Riders here, um, no advantages to any particular type of unit. Um, they do have frenzy, they do have physical resistance. That's great. Very expensive for a cavalry unit, for a unit that is outdated uh, by archer units. Um, this one here with shield, so you, you once again require the Ezra Armory, so requiring three kindreds to get that in total. Um, this one here is definitely the. I should probably make a distinction with the Wild Riders with shields, so they're definitely the least convenient out of the two. So I'm gonna put it like this. I'll leave these ones at tier at C tier because, like, if you really love cavalry, these are that. that look, they. They will probably let you down, but they won't let you down as much as this one here, I suppose. Even though that one has the best stats, it just comes down to the convenience of recruiting it. And you need to take the a number of build slots into consideration. Now, the most important thing to consider with the, the uh, cavalry, and why I'm being so mean, I guess, to their cavalry, is because, again, you have better options. We've got uh, the... What are they called? they got the Glade Riders, right? The Glade Riders with... Um, with the the horse archers so with the horse horse archer unit you've got a faster cavalry unit 94 speed comes in earlier at tier two if you know if you're actually going to build this building you've got 150 range which is really high for a horse archer unit um decent amount of ammo decent amount of missile strength less so than regular archers but what you can do with this unit here is hide the your rest of your troops, have them skirmish, nobody's going to be able to catch them, dish out some damage, and if you absolutely need to send it into melee, it can take out the lightest of troops. So if you need a cavalry unit, I would actually think that this one here could end up doing more damage. Like, these guys here could actually end up doing more damage to higher tier opponents than wild riders, just because you can avoid going into melee and shoot them. Like, if you're going up against, let's just say, a Grail Knight, right? This unit is not going to handle a Grail Knight. It's going to fucking die real quick. Um, but this unit here, a Grail Knight can't catch it. 
and you might use up all of your ammunition killing it, but you won't take any damage, right? And I think it's got enough ammunition to actually take out a Grail Knight. And like I said, it just won't catch you, as long as you're micro-ringing enough and it's a big enough map. So in terms of where I'm going to place these, this one here, I'm going to put it at B tier. It would go into A tier if, if it wasn't such an inconvenient building to recruit from. Uh, but this one here, I'm actually going to put it under trash, simply because what does it require? Oh, it requires that building? No thanks. So I'm just not going to recruit that one early. And all you're, all you're getting is poison damage, which actually is very useful for a horse archer unit because uh, it slows them down, but also magic damage, which again, we've already established, we don't really need that at that point there because you want to you wanna, um, combine magic damage with branch race and you just got better options by that time. So it's a good unit, but just inconvenient because of how, how it's been set up. All right, next one. I think we'll go Sisters of the Thorn next. Another cavalry unit. So this one's here at tier four. This is a, this is actually a good unit. It's been on the pricey point. You're losing a few entities with it. No longer at six, you're at 48. But it's got some range. It's got a lot of damage associated with it as well. And it's also got some spells. You've got the Shield of Thorns and the Curse of Andrew here. Now, if you put them in with Aerial, you can also boost them by a crazy amount as well. And they've got 40% physical resistance. So there's a lot of things that you can do with Sisters of the Thorn. And at tier four without requiring another building, you've got eight construction slots. This unit here is actually pretty good. So I'm gonna put it at A tier because there's a lot that you can do, do with it. I usually don't do it in my campaigns, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, you can do a lot with it. It's, it is a good unit, spamming it or otherwise. It's a good support unit, does a lot of damage. It, it, it can be quite squishy. Watch out for magic damage, watch out for missile units. Um, but it has a lot of utility, so yeah, it's a good unit. Okay, then we've got the Great Stag Knights here at Tier 5. So, I don't believe that this one should be a Tier 5 unit. I think it should go down to Tier 4. Uh, it doesn't take the Wood Elves that long to get to Tier 5, but, man, 375 cost for a Cavalry unit. You've got 32 entities, so you're losing more entities again. You've got 20% Physical Resistance, and you've got Frenzy, which is good. You've got Speed 90, which is good. But the thing that I can't get over is Tier Five, okay, tier five. It doesn't belong at tier five. It should be at tier four or tier three because you want this unit earlier. By the time you get to tier five, cavalry get less and less useful because the armies that you fight get bigger and bigger. And as the armies you fight get bigger and bigger, the amount of room to move around gets smaller and smaller comparatively. And so as you're fighting bigger and bigger armies, you need armies that can fight in smaller, tighter spaces and the Wood Elves totally have units that can do that. So it's a, the thing, that's the thing about the Great Stag Knights, right? It's a great unit for early in the campaign, but you can't get them in the early campaign unless you start off with one with the Sisters of Twilight. So where am I going to put it? I'm going to put it under C tier because it is a strong cavalry unit. It definitely is, but it's so inconvenient at tier five because you've already got all of your bases covered by that point, And this guy here just isn't really needed. So if it would just, come down a bit in tiers, it'd be a lot more convenient. That's that's actually one of the biggest problem with a lot of these racist cavalry. You simply get them far too late. They're not good enough for the tier that they come in at. And then there's just one more Wood Elf unit over here. Now this one here is a bit of a weird one, right? So we got Hawk Riders. Now depending on which faction you play as determines on what how good this actual unit is. In my units you should never recruit for every race, I put the Hawk Riders down at like the, the absolute bottom, the total trash, right? But they got an update, now that they can fire from 360 degree range, definitely makes them better. Now when you're playing as the Sisters of Twilight, we need to make this distinction. Sisters of Twilight, it's a Doomstack unit. So good because of the volleys of Kurnos. But if you're playing as any of the other three, and we need to take that into consideration as like removing sort of faction traits. Uh, I would say that this one is actually a C tier unit. So make that distinction. Heralds of Ariel, they're here. Everybody else, they're down here because the volley of Kurnos getting two or three of those shots makes such a huge difference with this unit because that is an army deleter. Um, but yeah, without it, they don't have that much damage dealing. They they don't they don't have much ammo. Um, they've only got 24 entities, and they're terrible in melee, so I'd, I'd, I'd probably put them at C tier, yeah. Uh, they can do some stuff, but I think at tier 3, you've actually got better choices if you're playing as anyone other than, than, um, Heroes of Ariel. Another thing to consider with Heroes of Ariel is that they can get them at tier 2, making them even more convenient, so 
really good unit for them, not so great for everyone else. All right, now we move on to the forest spirit section. Okay, first up, we've got dryads. Now, dryads being a melee infantry unit, you would uh, assume that I would be pretty negative towards them. Um, but, like, I wouldn't recruit them at tier 1, because, once again, we're, we're prioritizing this. But, I do like building this building, and I'm okay to build it at tier 2, or even at tier 3. And the thing is, if you're going to hire dryads, you're probably playing as Draka, right? Or, um, Durthu. And dryads are actually really good, as long as you're not going up against dwarfs. Dryads, because they've got a lot of physical resistance, and they're quite good at dishing out damage... Um, the early game units that you go up against, if you're going up against Petonia or whatever, um, actually kind of can't really deal with them very well. So I'm actually going to put Dryads at B tier. For, for an early game unit, they're quite cheap, they're quite effective. I actually like them a lot more than Glade Guard, um, because they've, they've got utility. So yeah, I'm going to put them there. And also, most of the Wood Elf units gain a lot of bonuses from fighting in the forest, so that's just a given, we should probably make that point. Okay, then we're going to talk about the Treekin. Alright, Treekin. So, this is a tier 3 unit. I usually build this building, so at this tier, so it's totally fine. It's it's not inconvenient. My problem with Treekin is their speed. They're slower than Dryads. They've got physical resistance. Most of the, the um, Forest Spirits do have physical resistance and magic damage. Which, at this point here, you're definitely going to want that Branch Wraith to mitigate magic damage. Especially if you're going up against, um... Sorry, mitigate magic resistance. Especially if you're going up against, um, Dwarfs. Um, but my problem with them is they're low entity number, they need to be fighting among other infantry units, and I just find that this is a, a defensive unit, it's got very high melee defense, it holds the line, that's what it does, it doesn't dish out damage, and from tree spirits, I kind of need them to dish out damage, you've got better options, so in terms of tree kin, I'ma put them under trash, I don't like them. Uh, I just don't think that they do a very good job. You can boost them by a ton. You absolutely can. But I would consider that a waste of effort. Because anybody that can boost Treekin can boost Treemen. And that is the unit that we'll, we'll talk about soon. Um, and I guess that's the big thing. They're just, they're just inferior to their larger cousins. Alright, next up let's talk about the Great Hawks. So, or they're actually Eagles. No, Great Eagles, sorry. Uh, great Eagles. I used to hate Great Eagles, right? But... If you take swooping into consideration, um, that is where you uh, take take your uh, flying unit and you attack a unit. And as you're landing, you give a move order just as they're about to land. And they'll actually land their attack order on, on like a melee infantry unit and not get hit and then keep flying. Great Eagles are very good as well at wasting enemy ammunition. So if your play is cheesy, like a me then Great Eagles are actually pretty good. I'm actually going to put them at B tier. The only reason I wouldn't put them any higher is because I usually don't build that building at tier 2. I usually wait until tier 3 before I start building it. Sometimes. It depends. Um, or sometimes, yeah, I don't know. I might even wait until tier 5 before I even start building it. So it's just kind of inconvenient to, to recruit it just because of um, another bloody recruitment building. Alright, next up we got Zoats. I don't know if it's supposed to be Zoats or Zotes. I'm not sure. So, I'm going to call them Zotes. I actually don't know. Um, so, Zotes. This is a bit of a weird one, because they're very expensive. They're tier 4. They are very strong, and they've got some magic. Um, the thing about Zotes is that for a tier 4 unit, they're almost tier 5. And at almost tier 5, you're getting close to Tree Men. And these are good units, and they do have dampening, so this one here can actually provide negative magic resistance, right? So if you're if you're attacking something that, ha like for if you team up with a branch race that's going going up against dwarfs, you get one of these guys, strip them of their magic resistance, and then use this, then they're at negative uh, magic resistance, and you're doing additional damage with magic attack. That's where it would be really handy. So I feel like Zotes are good. But I'm usually got my eye on the next tier above it, so I, I think they're good. I'm gonna put them at B tier. I'm gonna put them at B tier because they are good, but they're nowhere near as good as it's or as efficient as what's coming. I, I think spamming them, they definitely have problems. I think monstrous units like this that have multiple entities can be quite of a problem because. They just don't have the combat potential when you blob them up as these guys here. And when you spread them out, they really perform quite badly. And mixing them up in against other infantry units, you can do that. But that tends to be 
fairly ineffective because you've got to recruit a whole bunch of different recruit buildings. So it just depends on how you want to go about it. But I'm going to say it's a pretty average sort of unit. I'm going to put it at B tier. All right, next up, we got the Forest Dragon. Forest Dragons are excellent. I usually don't prioritize them just because I usually go for tree men. Uh, but this is definitely a Doomstack unit. Very, very strong unit. And because the Wood Elves have life magic, you can keep healing them. So looking at this unit, um, it's got physical resistance, which is really good. You got a lot of magic, uh, sorry, missile resistance. So going up against something that has, say, crossbows, but not magic damage, you're looking at 45% resistance there, which is really good for, for dragons because <laughs> they're going to get shot a lot. And there's a lot that you can do to boost it even further as well, so that's good. But they do tend to have fairly low hit points for like a tier 5 unit, and they're good. They're good. Don't get me wrong. They're good. But they're also at the same tier of tree men. Um, but hey, I put it under Doomstack. I just think that the tree men here is the numero uno Doomstack. Now, if I was to order these Doomstacks, I'd probably put them in this order here. Okay, so this one best, second best, third best, fourth best. Oops. Now, Tree Men. This is not only one of the best units in the, or the best unit in the Wood Elf roster, but one of the best units in the game, period. Not because of its base stats. You can look at a tree and be like, oh, what the fuck? It's slow, um, you know. It's expensive-ish. I mean, it's cheaper than a dragon, so you can give it that. Um, it's just super slow. How can he's always prioritizing speed over everything else? Why? Why? Why is this slow giant, armored giant, essentially uh, one of the best units in the game? It all comes down to how things play up on the campaign map. What you can do with tree men and how much you can boost them. You can boost them more than any other unit in the game, period. Because there's so much you can do to boost their physical resistance. Because if you have a look at Lord's skills, right? If I just find a Lord here. Uh, wait, get that one. Okay, let's get a, just a random Lord. Look at the skill tree. If we go to Ancient Bark, you got 10% extra physical resistance there. There's other... Legendary Lords as well that provide even more physical resistance and then at the forest roar You've got additional ma uh, missile resistance, which is their biggest weakness So when you're adding on an additional 25% resistances, right? And there's technologies as well and you can get rid of all the fire resistance uh, fire weakness. Sorry, right? You're looking at a unit that has ridiculous amounts of resistances up to 60 70% I've seen now another thing is that you Generally speaking, you put them in the trees and they fight even better and you can heal them. That's a big thing about giants, right? Like other factions giants. Uh, any faction that has giants can't heal them. Uh, but tree men can be healed. They've got heaps of hit points, heaps of resistances. They're actually incredibly good in, in uh, melee. You can uh, team them up with other... other um, heroes really really well so you've got the magic mitigation one branch wraith and then you put in a murder of spites one as well or you get your lord as a treeman um treeman lord uh with murder of spites so you've got a mortis engine because they last forever um then you couple in a life wizard and also a um a glade captain you put the glade captain over their heads and it increases their stats even further with with this with Dance of Lower, it boosted even further up to plus 10. And um, you're just buffing, buff, 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 buff. They just get buffed like crazy. And then it's, it's like it's, it's all about how they perform on the battle and on the campaign. Because they're so good as a Doomstack, you don't even need a full stack of them, right? Um, you can actually run your armies off a deficit, as in, like, have no money, and still mitigate uh, your replenishment problems because you can actually heal as you're fighting because these guys just fight so well with with life magic these ones here have so much synergy with life magic and with all of the other things that you can do in this faction that's what makes them so strong their base stats on their own don't seem that impressive but when you buff them this is what happened with the uh, the blade singers as you continue to just like build this team right you can build the most killer team possible with tree men, they are so goddamn strong if you do all that stuff. Of course, if you don't do that stuff, you'd be like, oh, what's that you're talking about? These are crap. Uh, but no, if you do all the stuff that I told you to do, get the Branch Wraith, get Life Wizard, get the Glade Captain, the, and get all the technologies needed to, to boost them, these guys get stupidly bloody strong. And there's just about no race in the game that can take on a tree men doom stack, even with four full stacks, if you've got enough wins to match. That's another thing as well, because the, uh, the Wood Elves, if you 
again, cheese this, recruit their um, knowledgeable lords, enough of them. You've got tons of Winds of Magic, so you can just keep boosting them as well with, uh, with Shields of Thorns and just boost, 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 boost. It's just absolutely crazy what you can do with, with, uh, with these tree men. And that's why they're the strongest unit in their race. So overall, a pretty strong race. Uh, they've only got a few units under trash. Everybody's going to have some trash. You can't put every single unit as A tier. Otherwise, it devalues the point of having an A tier. A um, few units in C tier here, but quite a lot under Doomstack A and B tier. So overall, a pretty strong race in terms of their army roster. Their biggest problem just being, I think, uh, supply lines and the fact that they just don't make any money from their outposts. And they've got a fragmented empire. That's a, a big problem for them. But anyway, that's the end of this one here guys hope you enjoyed it let me know in the comments below what you think because this is probably going to be one of the more contested ones uh because i've it, it, some of my t opinions about these guys here you know people do disagree with it and that's totally fine just let me know what you think um some of these units i definitely use more than others so this one here being the these ones here being the ones i've used the most actually i don't use blade singers that much but i know that they can be good uh that's why i probably gravitate towards them but anyway let me know your thoughts in the comments below appreciate you guys and i'll see you next time fuckers bye